Today we're gonna uh, talk about Thomas Solo algorithm, uh, which is um, different from the scoreboarding algorithm we talked about last time. Both of them are for dynamic scheduling of instructions. Here's a quick review of scoreboarding or scoreboard. Um, this scoreboarding technique was uh, first used in CDC 6600 machine. There are some limitations of the scoreboarding. One is no forwarding. There's uh, um, no short path of the um, results um, to the following instructions. Also, um, the scoreboarding technique is limited to instructions in a basic block. Uh, essentially, a basic block is a series of instructions, uh, all of them sequential. There's no branches um, uh, or conditional branches. And that's the concept of the basic block. So within the basic block, every instruction is sequential. There's no jumping around, no loops. Um, also, the scoreboarding is limited by the number of functional units. Scoreboarding checks two hazard, uh, write after read hazard, which is checked in the issue state, and uh, write after write hazard, which is checked in the write back stage. Um, in, if it sees both hazards, or either one of them, it will stall um, that particular instruction. And again, we're going to use the same six, uh, actually five instructions in this example to show how we're going to um, work these five instructions using Thomas Euler algorithm. Um, Oh, sorry. In, in fact, this is different from what we're going to use in our example. Uh, if you remember our example, we have first load, two load instructions, and then we have uh, multiply and then addition, subtraction, uh, division. Uh, this example here just shows you the uh, what is right after read and what is right after write uh, hazard. And for right after read, as you can see, we have a write to F8 or is this um, we're reading from F8. Um, this is write after read. And for this one, we have write after write. Okay. Um, this is called a up dependency. Okay. And both of them, both of these two dependencies, they actually can be resolved by using um, renaming. So that's why we call these two type of dependencies are uh, name dependencies. So imagine that you can replace this F8 with another register and you can move this instruction forward, right, because it does not really depend on this F8. Um, similarly for F6, this right after write hazard, you can rename this register um, to a different one, then this instruction can move forward. Um, so this is a uh, example of how we can rename. Um, so even though these two are the same register, we can uh, change this register to a different one without changing the correctness of this program. Um, similarly, we can do that. Um, let's see, sorry for this. This one, this is the right after write, and this one is read after write. This is at the true dependency, so we cannot do the renaming. Um, the way we implement this register renaming is through so-called reservation stations, or RFs. Reservation stations are per functional unit. The idea is to buffer the operand as soon as it is available. This is to avoid write after read hazard. Now recall that when we talk about scoreboarding, uh, we need to identify the source operands. But in that case, we use the ID of the operands. Let's say um, register app 10, then use 10 as the ID of that register. Um, 
here, what we are trying to do with this reservation stations is to buffer an operand. Here, we mean the value of the operand. So rather than storing the ID of the operand, we actually store the value of the operand. And we'll buffer the operand as soon as it is available, this is to avoid right after read hazard. Because if we can buffer the value, then this read is already completed, right? We got the value already, so it's okay for the following, for the later instructions to write a value, new values to that same register. For pending instructions, we, um, we designate reservation station that will provide their inputs. This is to avoid write after write hazard. Because when we write, let's say this one, um, we will use reservation stations. For example, we'll have a reservation station for ADD and we have another reservation station for uh, this store. Even though they uh, write to the same register, but because we encapsulate everything within that reservation station, so these writes will be safe. Okay. And the last write in the sequence of the same register writing will actually update the register. Uh, that's what we want. That's the uh, program uh, to ensure the program correctness. And we use decentralized hazard detection and execution control. Yeah, we'll see how that happens. Instruction results are passed directly to the functional units from reservation stations rather than from registers. We just said earlier that we will have these reservation stations to encapsulate the whole instruction, including the result of the instruction, because we have a buffer in it. Um, so we are able to pass around these values through a bus and we call this bus as a common data bus. Uh, instead of doing reading from registers. So that's a good benefit to free up um, the access to the registers. Otherwise, register file is going to be a structural hazard unless you have um, large number of ports. And here comes Thomas Silverberg algorithm. Uh, this is, was invented for IBM Machine 360 three years after CDC 6600. The goal of this design is to um, provide high performance without special compilers. So still we want to simplify, simplify the compiler design and we want to do these um, dynamic scheduling of instructions in hardware at runtime. And we talked about last time that why we want to do in hardware and runtime rather um, as a compared to doing um, register, I mean compiler dependent techniques. Um, here's a list of the differences. Uh, in fact, we already um, discussed some of those. Between Thomas Solo and scoreboarding, um, the control and buffer are distributed with functional units versus centralized. In Thomas Solo, we use these reservation stations. Reservation stations, as you will see, it has a lot of information, and uh, uh, all of them are connected to the common data bus. They will be able to detect the values that sent out to the common data bus uh, as compared to the centralized control in the scoreboard. Registers in instruction replaced by pointers to reservation station buffer. Uh, we will use a table to indicate where we can get the value from, uh, and that identifier is the identifier of the reservation station. Well, you can think about it as a pointer to the reservation station. We use hardware-based renaming registers to avoid right after write hazard. Uh, for reading the operand, we read the value as soon as it is available to um, the reservation station. This is to avoid write after write hazard. 
we use a common data bus CBD, CDB to broadcast result to all the functional units. We treat load and store as functional units as well. And there's a lot of um, applications of these Thomas Solar algorithms in um, later processors. Here's the hardware design. Uh, let's start from the instruction unit. This is the instruction queue. So you will have instructions queued up here uh, waiting to be dispatched to different functional units. Uh, we have floating point registers. The reason we um, focus on floating point because floating point operations, especially multiplication and division, take a lot of cycles. And that's where we do need this dynamic scheduling to be able to uh, schedule later instructions. For integer instructions, um, the need is not that um, significant as in floating point instructions. Um, we have some functional units. Um, this is the address unit. Essentially, this is a um, adder type of unit because you need to calculate the memory address. And you have memory unit, you have floating point adders and floating point multipliers. And these boxes, okay, store buffers, load buffers, and reservation stations, these are all um, reservation station um, like structures. Uh, and we use these to store the values of the operands, also the status of the functional unit. There are a lot of connections for data. Let's talk about this one first. This is so-called common data bus. As you can see, it connects to every uh, functional unit, ex except this uh, load buffer. This common data bus, of course, we have data on it, and that's the result of the instructions. Also, the common data bus um, includes the source of this data. That is to say, the ID of the reservation station that produced this result. That's also um, um, showing up as a part of the common data bus. So it's not only data, but also the IDs of the reservation station that produce this data. And this is connected to every reservation station, including store buffer. Uh, this is to broadcast the result to every other station who might be waiting for this result from that particular reservation station. Um, the rest of the lines are, um, for example, here, floating point operations. This comes from the instruction. Uh, depends on what kind of instruction it is, it will either go through this set of reservation station or this set of reservation station. And we have also operand buses um, where the values from the registers will be supplied to these reservation stations. Okay, so this is the hardware structure. And this is a summary of the components that we just looked at. Uh, upper code, I mean, the, these fields are uh, what you're going to expect in the reservation station. First is the upper code. Um, this is the operation to perform in the unit. Uh, we see in this slide that, for example, we have a floating point adder, this unit. And the operation we may perform using this adder is subtraction addition. For multiplier, we could either um, perform um, multiplication or division. And then we have this VJ and VK. Note here, these are the values of the source operands. Okay. So instead of storing the ID of the register, we store the actual value of the source operand. 
and then QJ and QK. These are the reservation stations producing source registers. So this corresponding QJ corresponding to VJ, QK corresponding to VK. And these are the IDs of the reservation station that produce these operands. If they are zero, that means the operand is ready. So the value is already here. BZ is an indication indicating that reservation station or function unit is busy. We also have a register result status table, uh, similar in scoreboarding. This table indicates which function unit will write which register if there is one to write. Uh, it will be blank if no pending instructions that will write that register. We have three stages of um, operation in Thomas Solo algorithm. The first stage is issue. And in the issue stage, it's essentially get instruction from the uh, instruction queue. And in this stage, um, we will need to check if there's any structural hazard. And of course, if there is any, then we cannot do the issue. We'll check if reservation station R is free or not, and issue logic issues instruction to R and read operands to R if they are ready. And we're going to perform register renaming by putting the R into register status table for the destination register. So in the register status table, we will always record that which instruction is going to update the value of the destination register. The second stage is execution. Okay. Uh, it's operate on the operands, of course. Now here we will check if the operands are ready or not. Because even if we issue them, one or two of the operands may not be ready. In that case, we cannot um, execute this instruction. If the operands are ready and we can execute the instruction, then after a certain number of cycles, the result will be uh, produced. So the third stage will be write result. In this stage, the reservation station will write the result onto a common data bus. And because the common data bus also has information about which reservation station is producing the result, and it will uh, pass that information to other reservation stations who might be waiting for the result from this particular reservation station. So we'll, in the right back stage, we'll make mark the reservation station available. We'll write the result into the destination register if it is status. Its status is R. This status is stored in the um, register status table. So compared to normal data bus, where we have this data plus destination, um, in the common data bus, we know data and source. So that's why we uh, think this common data bus, CDB, is a come from bus, whereas um, conventional data bus is go to bus. So in this common data bus, we have 64 bit of data and four bits of functional unit source address. So essentially, you are talking about 16 functional units. It will write if matches expect a functional unit. Result is produced. And it will uh, do the broadcast to all the reservation stations. Um, do you have these two pages with you or not? Okay, um, let me quickly make some copies.
So we're going to look at this example program where we have six instructions. Uh, we're going to use Thomas Sula algorithm to schedule these instructions dynamically in hardware. And in this example, the assumptions uh, remain the same, uh, meaning the load instructions take two cycles to load data um, and multiply instructions, I think, takes 15. Yeah, yeah, the so division is 40 cycles. And subtraction and addition takes um, two cycles. And we have a number of load buffer. Okay, we have three load buffers. And we have three adders and two multipliers. Okay. So this, these are the reservation stations. Load buffer is listed separately here. Um, load buffer is also considered a reservation station, although we do not name it, uh, it that way. We have this register result status. So here we have the name of the registers, and then we have the functional unit, uh, which is going to produce the result for that register. So this is the cycle number zero. This is, we can see this regard, this is the end of the cycle number zero. So at the beginning of the next cycle, we need to decide whether we can issue this first instruction or not. If you look at the handout, the first stage is issue. So we check for structure hazard. If the reservation station R is free, and issue logic issues this instruction to the reservation station and read off RANs into R if they are ready. Okay. So for this first instruction, this is a load instruction. We know that uh, it will use one of these load buffers. We have three of them, so of course there is no structural hazard. We can use one of them. Right? So we will issue this load instruction but also know that in the issue stage, you will read operands into R if they are ready. What is the operand for this loading instruction? 34 and R2. R2 is an integer operand, right? It's an integer register, and it is ready. So we're going to read the value of R2, okay? and then we're going to use that value um, to do addition on the 34, and that's the address we'll use to do the load operation. So it seems like in the first cycle, we should be able to issue this load instruction uh, using this first load buffer, and we'll put the address here. So this is the first cycle, we'll issue this load instruction, uh, we'll mark this load buffer as BZ, and the address, which is 34 plus R2, we're going to load the value here. Okay. Also, uh, we will perform the register renaming, um, that is to say, for the destination register F6, we're going to put the name of the reservation station uh, or load buffer is the load one. This is to say, uh, for F6, if you want to use F6, you need to wait for load one to produce the result. Okay, so that's all for cycle number one. So this is what you're gonna expect to see at the end of the first cycle. Okay. So. For the next cycle, for cycle number two, what will we do? So can we put this first load instruction into uh, execution stage? So let's check. So execution is uh, operate on operands. When both operands are ready, then execute. 
So we should execute this first load instruction because you have this operand ready. Right? Go ahead and load the value from memory. Um, also, we need to check the next instruction, whether we can issue this one or not. And this is similar to the first load instruction, so we should be able to issue this instruction and uh, use the second load buffer and put the address here. So that's right. So we have the second <laughs> cycle, the second load instruction is issued. Uh, we mark the second load buffer as BZ. The address is recorded here, and we update the register result status. Okay, that's good. So this is the end of the second cycle. We're going to do next cycle. Um, load instruction, this first load will take two cycles to finish the loading. So it will do two and three. Okay? So in the third cycle, it's still loading. Um, for this instruction, in the third cycle, it will start execution. Then we're going to look at this multiply. Can we issue this instruction or not? Okay. Let's see. The, if you look at the handout, we'll get instruction from the 14 point operation queue. So this is the multiply instruction. We'll check for structural hazard. So we'll check for structural hazard. That is to say, we'll check if there's any free reservation station for this multiply. Right? And we have two multiplier uh, function units of reservation stations here. So it is free. So do we issue this instruction or not? Okay, very good, very good observation. So if you read this uh, first issue stage, the explanation carefully, it says if reservation station R is free, then issue logic issues instruction to R. Okay, that's the first step. And read operands into R if they are ready. So it will issue, even though the operand is not ready. It will issue, by issue the instruction, this instruction will take one reservation station. It just occupies one reservation station. For this case, its operand R2 is not ready, but that's fine, we just record that it's not ready. But still, we'll move ahead to issue this instruction because there are two operands. The other one may be ready. And by putting this instruction into the reservation station, we don't mean that this is going to be executing. OK, so we're going to put this multiply instruction into the first multiplier and we'll read the value if it is read operands if it is ready if not we'll mark that it's not ready and one of the operand is f2 okay, that's v uh, vj okay. the value is not ready so we need to put a note here in a qj saying we are waiting for f2 and which unit, which reservation station or load buffer we're waiting for. So what we should put into this QJ here. Okay, this VJ and VK keep the value. QJ and QK keeps the ID of the reservation station if the value is not ready. So 
let's do this. J, this operand is F2. Okay? When you check this table, you see that F2 is not ready. This load 2 is going to produce the result. So for this J, the value is unknown yet, but we do know this load 2 is going to produce F2. So we will put load 2 here. Okay. The hardware operation is simple. It just looks up in this table, and whatever ID here is going to be copied to here. That's how we say J is not ready, but J is going to be produced by this load 2. For K, okay, it's F4. When we check this table, it's empty here. That means F4 is ready. So we'll just load the value of F4 to VK. And also, we need to um, update the register status table to say that this instruction multiply this unit. Actually, this unit that executes this instruction will be producing the result of F0. So this is what you see. Okay. The first instruction is moving forward, and the second load instruction is also moving forward, and we're issuing this third instruction multiply, and we mark this function unit as PZ. We um, put the value of R4 here in the VK, and we also put the ID of the um, load buffer that's going to produce the result for F2, okay, this load 2, load 2. That's for the, um, the second load instruction. And we're going to mark this at multiply 1 because uh, this instruction is going to produce the result for F0. QK. Yeah, so if there's nothing here, that means a 0. Okay, so this is what we see at the end of cycle number 3. Now, what will happen in the next cycle? Okay. 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 Very good. So let's look at these one by one. The so first instruction um, finishes at the end of the third cycle. It's going to do right back in the fourth cycle. And when we look at the um, note here, that right result, that's the third stage. Uh, it will write on common data bus to all waiting units. Okay, so this one is going to write the result, whatever value it loads from address 34 plus R2. Okay, and we will see if any one is waiting for that yet. This is very interesting. See, if you look at this subtraction instruction, first of all, maybe we can talk about this first. So this instruction should be able to be issued right, because this one requires a adder. So we're going to um, assign adder 1 to this instruction. Um, and this instruction is going to read F6 which is exactly the destination operand of the loading instruction. And this is going to write back. So this is when the um, bypass, the forwarding, the forwarding happens. 
right? So you expect that for this subtraction instruction, it'll take adder, first adder. So this is the busy, this is gonna be subtraction, and this upper and j, you will have the value that's coming from the first load instruction. And the second operand, operand k, because when we look at this table, still loading, right? And this load 2, so this value is unknown yet, so we're going to put this load 2 here. For multiply, because at the end of this cycle, this load 2 is still not done yet. So it has to wait. So we'll not move this multiply into the execution stage. OK, so this is what was we, uh, we just discussed. This first load instruction is in the right backstage. And because of the forwarding, the subtraction instruction, which takes the first adder, will receive the value loaded from the first load instruction. And we label the value as memory parenthesis A1. So this first address, that's the memory, um, the value loaded from memory. For its operand K, uh, we'll just record is load two because that's the one uh, who is going for going to produce the result. Uh, multiply is still waiting. Okay. All right. So this is the end of cycle number four. What's going to happen in the next cycle? Which one? VJ. Okay. Very okay. good. Very good. Yep. Uh, also for subtraction, right? Oh, yeah, subtraction. Yep. Yep. But the one tricky question is now will either multiply or subtraction move forward? In cycle number five? Yeah, both of them, they have their operands. But that's by the end of cycle number five. Okay. Yeah, not the beginning of cycle number five, right? Yeah. So in cycle number five, you have to, uh, the illustration here is a little bit confusing. You have to be very clear about what you see here is the end of cycle number four. Okay, And because at the end of cycle number four, you don't have the value yet. For this one, you don't have it. For this one, you don't have it. So you cannot execute them in cycle number five. Yeah. So in cycle number five, uh, when this load two finishes, it writes the result to the common data bus. And during this cycle number five, the value is going to be received by these two functional units. But they have to wait until the next cycle to start execution. Um, so this is what we see. This load instruction is going to write back the result. We're going to clear this BZ uh, flag. And 
the memory value loaded will be broadcast to this at a subtraction, also broadcast to this multiplication. Okay. And in the same cycle, division instruction is issued because we do have a free reservation station. And we're going to uh, check the operands, F0, check the table, that's multiply 1, so we're going to put multiply 1. For F6, that's already known, so we're going to put the value here, okay. and we're going to record that instruction um, here in the register result status table. Right. Okay, so this is the end of cycle number five. And so we have both operands ready for both subtraction instruction and uh, multiplying instruction. So in the next cycle, these two will be uh, start thing the execution for division it has to wait because multiply is not done yet okay. what about addition in the sixth cycle in the coming cycle can we issue instruction number um, six the addition instruction Remember, we issue the instruction if there's a free reservation station. So there is a free reservation station. So we'll issue instruction um, number six, the add, floating point add. So that's what you see. Um, both multiply and subtraction begin execution and addition instruction is issued. And in cycle number seven, subtraction it's completed at the end of this cycle number seven. Um, and the other two instructions are still waiting because uh, the operands are not ready yet. So the next cycle, the subtraction will um, go into the right back stage. And let's see who's waiting for the result. Anyone's waiting for the result of uh, This F8, yep. So the addition is waiting for the completion of subtraction instruction. So that's how you check it, right? Because this um, F8 is adder one, okay, and this adder two is waiting for adder one. It's the result. So in the next cycle, the value will be populated to will be broadcast to this uh, J operand also stored into uh, that register. And in the next cycle, because, um, let me see. Yeah, in the next cycle, for addition, this instruction takes the second adder function unit. It has both operands ready, so it will uh, begin execution. Okay, so that's why in cycle number nine, uh, this one begins execution. And it takes another cycle to complete. And it will then write the result back to F6. 
f6 has the value. And this is exactly the how Tomasolo resolves right after read hazard. Okay, this is the the renaming. Um, this actually, um, uh, even though this division instruction is still waiting for the operands to be ready, but the value um, is already um, loaded to F6, this memory value. Uh, one more cycle for all the instructions, and then we have another couple of cycles for multiply to finish. And the, once this finish, it will write back. And because this division instruction is waiting for this result, so the result from this instruction will be broadcast to this VJ. And then after um, 40 cycles, 40 cycles, this division is completed. Then right back. Okay. So um, these set of slides showed you how um, the Tomasolo resolves right after read and right after write hazard uh, using reservation stations. Um, next set of examples uh, about a loop. So here we have a loop with five instructions in it uh, in one iteration. We first do load and then multiply, then store, then um, subtraction. Well, this subtraction is an integer subtraction. And this is to change the um, R1 so that this load can re, um, load a new value from a different location. And there's a branch instruction to determine the end of this loop. Here we assume that multiply takes four clock cycles and the first load takes eight cycles because of miss, and the second load takes one clock, because after the first load, you will load the whole cache block, and the following instructions will be load instructions will be um, cache hit. We'll show clocks for subtraction and uh, a branch. All right, this is cycle number zero. Um, we have load, multiply, store load, multiply, store. Now this is kind of unrolling the loop. Right? This is the first iteration and the second iteration. Um, the integer operations are not shown here. Um, but you know that it has a separate integer unit which can do the um, decrement and also um, do the branch condition checking. We have three load buffers and three store buffers, and we have again three adders, reservation station for the adder function unit, and I have two reservation stations for the multiply unit. Okay. 
right? Um, let's see, this is the value in R1, and these are the values. Um, these, this is the register status table. So we'll, we'll do the term algorithm again. First, we're going to check the first instruction to see if we can issue this instruction or not. And of course, there's free load buffer. So we load that. The address is 0 plus the value of R1, which is 80. So the address is 80. And we will um, put F0 as load 1. Okay. And this is the end of the first cycle. In the next cycle, we will issue this multiply because we do have a pre reservation station. When we issue that, um, we take the reservation station, we mark it as a busy. Um, we have two operands. For the J, we have F0, which is load 1. Okay, so we have to mark QJ as load 1 because the value is unknown yet. And for K, and there's nothing going to produce F2. That means F2 is ready, so we're going to read the value of F2. Okay. And we mark this F4 as multiply 1. Well, next cycle. Good. Second yep. Good. And the store instruction will be issued. Great. Yep. Yes. So this is still ongoing, and multiply instruction stalls here, and we issue the um, store instruction. For the store instruction, we'll take store buffer. Um, the address is again 80. Okay. The value we're going to store is. F4, when we look at this table, that's multiply 1, so we'll put multiply 1 here. So this is the end of cycle number 3. What's going to happen in the next cycle? Now, here is the program. Okay, we have load, multiply, store, then we have subtraction, this is the integer subtraction, and then we have this branch. So the next cycle is in fact it's gonna execute this subtraction instruction. And this is an integer unit. So it's separate from this table. Okay. All these here are for the floating point. But it still takes one cycle to do the subtraction. So this is cycle number four. This is gonna be Execute it, and then cycle, um, cycle number five. Because this subtraction is going to update the value of R one, so in cycle number five, R one is going to be seventy two. Okay, and it's seventy two. Then we do branch if it is not equal to zero. So it will branch. Back to the beginning. So we're going to look at load instruction in the next cycle. Okay. 
because at the end of cycle number five, we know we'll do this one. So in the sixth cycle, we will issue this instruction or not. We have a free reservation station. We do have a reservation station. And the address is 72. So we issue this building instruction in cycle number six. And we will mark this as a busy, record the address, and we'll update register result status. Now, you see this is going to be overriding load 1, okay? which is exactly what we intended to do. Because this here shows that who will lastly produce the result of for this F0. That's indeed what the program does. So this load 2 is going to produce the, last, the latest result for F0. So in this case, we actually go over a basic block. So we jumping into the second iteration of the loop. This is what the scoreboarding cannot do. So what we're going to try to do here, because mm -hmm. as, as you see the code, suppose the stored instruction yeah. loads a value, say, 8 yeah. to R1, and when we subtract, it becomes 0. So if the loop is not executed at the first, when the loop itself is not executed, then will this result be correct? The overriding of the basic block. No, because what you're, what you record in this table, is to say, which functional unit is going to produce the last result, the latest result of F zero. Now, if you look at the first iteration, it's true that this F zero is going to be used by multiply. It's not going to be the same as this F zero. But this dependency is already recorded here. It says this multiply instructions is waiting for the result from load 1, not load 2. Okay? So that dependency is already um, recorded or resolved in the reservation station. So that's the um, tricky or nice thing here. Because for later instructions, when we get to this load instruction, for later instructions, it is true that the result is going to be, the latest value of F0 is going to be produced by load 2. But for this multiply, it's going to rely on the load of the first load instruction, the value from the first load instruction. So this is the end of cycle six. Um, so what's going to happen in cycle number seven? So can we execute this multiply? This is a multiply. We can only execute when both operands are ready. Not done yet, right? Load one is not done yet. So this has to stop. Multiply stop. What about this store? This is a store one, store buffer number one. It's waiting for multiply. Okay, it's not there yet. So this has to stop. What about this load? Okay, seems fine. We have the address. Okay. So can we do a number seven? 
to say that we're going to execute load in the seventh cycle. So for load instruction, for any instruction, first thing we want to check is any other constraint, any other hazard, structural hazard. Now you have the previous load instruction still ongoing, and this is the memory access. Assume that we don't have um, the uh, advanced design of uh, for the cache, so you cannot issue another load while the other one is still ongoing. So that's why we cannot um, move this instruction to the execution stage. But we, we can do something else. We can issue this multiply because we do have a free functional uh, reservation station. And that's what we're going to do exactly. So we're going to um, issue this one. And we know that we're going to wait for the result from low 2. And we. Um, will say F4 multiply 2. So this is another um, overriding we do. Okay, we override multiply 1 with this um, multiply 2. So this is the end of the seventh cycle. Um, what we're going to do in the next cycle? Cycle number eight. Okay. Um, I think we said something about cash miss, so there will be a, a actually a long number um, of cycles for the load for the first load. Uh, so we're not done yet. Um, but if we have a cache miss, then we will be done uh, in one cycle. But we do have a cache miss for the first load. But we can um, issue this um, store instruction. So we'll do that. So take one um, store buffer. We're going to um, mark the Q has multiply 2. Okay, we get that information from here. Right? Uh, the destination is F4, and we look up this table, it's multiply 2, so we know we're going to wait for multiply 2. So um, note here the first and second iteration completely overlapped. So all the instructions are issued. It takes eight cycles for the first load to finish. And then for the next cycle, we will um, execute subtraction. Then we check the um, branch. Okay. At the end of cycle number 10, we write the result. I mean, uh, in cycle number 10, load instruction will write the result um, because multiple one is, was waiting for load 1, so the value is broadcast here. So this VJ is ready. And for load instruction, the second load instruction will move on. Okay. Now, this again, the 
uh, note here this second load is a cash hit so there's only one cycle needed here so in next cycle it was doing the right back Also, the other thing is because we update R1, so this is now um, 64. So this is the end of cycle number 10. What's going to happen in the next cycle? For this multiply, we're going to execute because we have both operands. So you have 11 here. For store instruction, no, it has to wait. For load instruction, it's going to do right back. Because it takes only one cycle now um, for the load. Okay. So when it does the right back, whoever is waiting for load will get the result. Who's waiting for? Oh, this multiply is waiting for this load. So next cycle you have the value here. Okay, that's what's happening. Okay. You have both values for these two instructions. And then Mm -hmm. Here, yep. That's right. So, load three. That's actually for this instruction, right? Yeah. Yep. The third, yeah, the third iteration of the loop. So that's. The, um, no. First multiplication, let's see. Let's go back to one cycle. Okay, so the end of cycle is number 10. You have both values. I think you're right. So this multiply should move on to the execution. Now remember, we have these two multiplying instructions ongoing, and we get a chance to look at the third multiplying instruction, right? Because this here is actually, now we get to the point that we're going to the third iteration of the loop, and we know that we can load this, we can issue this third load, but can we issue the third multiply? No, because the restriction of the reservation stations. So we cannot load um, the next one. Oh, I see why it's not showing here, because this is um, this tried to illustrate the third multiplying instruction. That's why it's not showing up. Oh, no, actually, because if you look at the iteration, uh -huh. So like, they're not like showing anywhere the third right, so that, you're right, so we, we should actually have a um, um, another three instructions listed below. But you get the point. Right. Um, that's to say that the third multiplying instruction is issued in, in cycle 14. Um, that's when A minute. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, this is still for this first multiplying instruction because we issue this 
cycle number two. Okay. Um, now I don't see why we didn't. Say it again. Yes, it completes at cycle forty. What is it? Yes. Yep. So we did execute that instruction cycle eleven. Starting from cycle eleven, we execute the first multiply. Okay, then in the fifth in the fifteenth cycle we do write back. So this multiply will write back to this load one. So you got the value here. For this multiply, it completes at fifteen. It started at twelve. Okay. And uh, let's see. Um yep. So the Next stage is for the second multiplier to do the right back. So this actually should be cleared out because you got a value now. By the end mm -hmm. of block cycle 15, uh, we could have loaded the multiplier instruction for the third iteration. Yes, you're right, which is not shown here. Yeah. Because we have a free reservation station. Um, but this cycle, I think this should be cleared out because we now have the value. And then in cycle number 17, this store instruction will be executing. Okay, so here's a summary of Thomas Solo. Uh, it prevents register as a bottleneck. So instead of loading operands from registers, um, it used buffers as a part of the reservation station to store the values, um, either from the register or as soon as they are produced from another reservation station. It can avoid right after read and right after write hazard of scoreboarding. Um, it allows loop unrolling in hardware as we just saw in the example. As a result, it's not limited to basic blocks um, provided that we have a correct branch prediction. Um, the impact is significant uh, in terms of doing dynamic scheduling, register renaming, and also load and store disambiguation. Okay, uh, there are some additional readings you want to do.